Hello there and welcome back to another CPV talk. My name is Jasmine and I'm a senior in transfusion. We are going to be going through today Charlie and Taco. This is going to be the first of many presentations on transfusion reactions. So what are we covering today? We're going to go through an overview of transfusion reactions in general, as we haven't done anything about that yet on the channel. We're going to go into what Charlie is, what Taco is, what their causes are, how we tell the difference, how they should be treated, how we reduce the risks of patients contracting these reactions. We're going to go through a case study and then there will be a summary and thanks. So, transfusion reactions, what are they? They're basically any event that happens as a result of infusing blood or a cell therapy product that isn't good for the patient. So it'll be a negative response from the body that occurs as a result of a transfusion. There are many different types of transfusion and normally they're sorted into either acute or immediate, um, both of those terms can be used, or delayed reactions. Acute reactions have an onset of within 24 hours normally. Depending on the reaction that you're talking about, it could be up to 24 hours or it could be less than 24 hours. Um, and we'll go into the specifics of what we're talking about today in a bit. And in each transfusion reaction we talk through, we will talk about the normal time frame that you would expect the reactions to occur in. Whereas the delayed ones normally occur within days of the transfusion. So it takes a lot longer for um, the reaction to happen. Sometimes it can be weeks, depending on the type of delayed transfusion. Within these groups, there are then several different types of reactions so the most well known will be the hemolytic transfusion reaction and we can again split transfusion reactions into two categories we can go hemolytic or non-hemolytic but hemolytic is the one that everyone knows about that's due to an abo incompatibility you've then got allergic or anaphylactic reactions so that tends to be with rashes redness etc You've got Charlie and Taco, which obviously we're talking about today, and you've got transfusion associated graft versus host disease. There are a couple of others, so you've got things like bacterial contamination, etc. Um, but as I said, we're going to talk about them in another talk. So these can then obviously be separated into their specific types of reactions. We're going through Charlie and Taco today. What is Charlie? Charlie stands for Transfusion Related Acute Lung Injury. So from that title, immediately you can tell there's going to be some form of involvement from the lung. It is defined as acute dysponia, which is difficult or laboured breathing, with hypoxia, reduced oxygen levels, and bilateral pulmonary infiltrates during or within six hours of transfusion. So this would be an acute reaction because it's within that 24 hour mark. Um, but specifically with Charlie, you're expecting it to happen within six hours. And it's not due to circulatory overload or other causes. As I mentioned, it's an acute reaction and its presentation was already sort of discussed in that definition. What's TACO? So TACO is transfusion associated circulatory overload. Um, and it is related to fluid overload. It is defined as the presentation of at least four of the following symptoms, again, within six hours of transfusion. So it's still an acute reaction. So those four could be acute respiratory distress, tachycardia, increased blood pressure, acute or worsening pulmonary edema, and evidence of positive fluid balance. So there are obviously five options there. It can be any four of those five and it could be, and then it will be defined as TACO. Its clinical presentation has a bit more to it than with Charlie. You will see left ventricular failure, dyspnea, tachypnea, which is abnormal rapid breathing, a non-productive cough, raised jugular venous pressure, basal lung crackles, frothy pink sputum, hypertension and tachycardia. So what causes these conditions? Both of these are no, what's known as pulmonary complications of transfusion and they are some of the most dangerous types of reactions. 
as I said before, most people are aware of hemolytic transfusion reactions as being really dangerous. However, due to all of the pre-transfusion testing we have in place nowadays, they happen very, very rarely. Whereas Taco and Charlie, they tend to cause the most morbidity um, out of the transfusion reactions. Taco is caused by over-transfusion of fluids. Um, since when a patient is given too many components in a period of in a period of time, or when a transfusion is too rapid, so it's very important there. A lot of people are aware of the over transfusion, so giving too many components within a small time period, but it could technically happen from just one transfusion if that transfusion is not given over a suitable period of time. So don't be fooled if you see that they're coming up with these sorts of symptoms and they've only had one unit, it could still be TACO. Trali, however, is caused by HLA antibodies present in transfused plasma products. These products are normally donated by women who have created the antibodies as a result of pregnancy. So, TACO is a lot more common than Trali, and that's because the NHSBT has gone through great lengths to try and reduce the risks of plasma products containing these antibodies. How do you tell the difference between the two types of transfusion reactions? As you can tell from what we've already gone through, um, they are very similar in their presentation. However, they do have some distinct symptoms and expected results. That doesn't stop clinicians and lab techs from getting confused and it's really important that we know the difference because the type of treatment that we're going to give them will change um, and you can make it worse if you're treating someone who has Charlie with the treatment for TACO uh, and it's because of this confusion that there is so much more mortality and morbidity associated with these complications because they're either not identified in a timely manner because the patient has pre-existing conditions or they're confused and it makes it worse instead of helping treat the patient. So it's really important that people are aware of the differences between the two. I've put them in this table. This is a combination of a couple of tables from different sources. So. The first column has the indication, so for example, type of component. In Charlie, you're going to expect it to be as a result of plasma or platelets because they are going to be the ones that have those antibodies in them. How with TACO, you can have a reaction with red blood cells, although you know plasma is quite often involved. Blood pressure, in Charlie it's hypotension, Whereas in TACO, it's hypertension. Onset. So with Charlie, it usually happens within two hours of transfusion, although it can be up to six hours. Whereas TACO is not, doesn't really have that, oh, it normally happens within the two hours. It's just defined as occurring within six hours. So while this isn't the greatest one to tell the difference between them, if it's happening faster, then there's the chance that it's going to be Charlie over TACO. Chest x-ray, you'll expect to see the bilateral pulmonary infiltrates on both x-rays. However, with TACO, as the name says, it's got cardiac overload, you're going to expect an enlarged heart, whereas with Charlie, the heart will be normal. The BNP in Charlie will be less than 250, whereas in TACO it will be greater than 250. The TNIs will be normal in Charlie and elevated in TACO. The echo will be normal in Charlie, again, because it's lung involvement, um, but abnormal in TACO because it's cardiac involvement. The pulmonary wedge pressure will be low in Charlie and raised in TACO. FVC results. So this is not the most reliable indicator, but in Charlie, you quite often see a fall in neutrophils and monocytes, followed by neutrophil leukocytosis. Whereas in TACO, there won't really be any change from the patient's normal full blood count results. Um, the oxygen saturation in both of them will be reduced. And then the treatment options are where there's a big difference here. So Charlie will improve with fluid load, 
that will worsen with diuretics, whereas taco is the opposite. So if you think that someone has taco and they actually have trali and you give them um, diuretics, then you're going to make them get worse instead of better. And that's why it's really important to tell the difference between the two. As I said, obviously you've got that lovely table, which everyone should be aware of. Um, however, it has been accepted that the definitions of the two are currently unsatisfactory. Um, so Schott have also created a checklist for TACO to help differentiate this from other complications. And I've got a picture of that checklist on this slide. Um, so it's just good to have a look at it and see how that would relate to your patients. The treatment, as I said, um, there are some things that are the same and then you've got the two very distinct differences. So in TACO, you would stop the current and future transfusions. Remember this is due to fluid overload, right? So you don't want to add more fluids to the patient, you're going to make it worse. The oxygen saturation will be low, so they need to be given oxygen. Diuretics, as I said, is the treatment option for TACO, and if needed, then they should be given assisted ventilation because obviously they're going to have trouble breathing. That's one of the um, symptoms. Trali, you would stop the current transfusion because if it's caused by an antibody in that transfusion, you don't want to continue to pump them full of that blood product if they are still being transfused when the reaction occurs, obviously. Again, the oxygen saturation will be low, so they should be given oxygen. And then they should be given fluid, not diuretics, fluids, um, as we mentioned in the table before. And they should be given ventilator pressure support. Treatment options are all well and good, and obviously we need to be aware of them. But the best thing we can do is prevent them from having the reaction in the first place. Right? That's why we have transfusion laboratories. So, having a look at what the definitions are, are and what they're caused by, there are a couple of ways that we can change our practice to try and prevent these happening. So with Charlie, there's not really much you can do in the lab, um, but it's more of a national change that has occurred in the last few years. And that is that the NHSBT generally no longer accepts plasma donations from women, um, especially not women who have previously been or are currently pregnant. They also test plasma products for HLA antibodies. So when you are in the lab and someone phones up saying that they think that it's Charlie, the chances of that are very, very, very slim because the products that we have now should not contain any of those antibodies. It can still happen, but it is much more likely that it's going to be a TACO reaction than a Charlie one. To prevent TACO, we basically have to work with clinicians to prevent unnecessary transfusions, um, which is why one of the reasons why we have the BMS empowerment scheme, right, is to stop wastage of blood products and unnecessary transfusions. So it's just to ensure that you're sticking by that and you're questioning clinicians. Um, and if you don't agree, then you pass them on to a consultant. Ensure that blood components are dosed on weight. That is the gold standard, whether they are a low volume patient or a higher volume patient the clinician should have done their dosing in weight. Obviously, it's more important if they're a lower volume patient because they are going to be the patients that are more likely to have a TACO reaction. If you're, if a clinician asks to reverse or anticoagulants, then batch products such as Beriplex should be considered over the use of FFP. Beriplex is obviously just a small injection or a couple of small injections, depending on the dose. Whereas FFP, you're probably going to have to give between three and five bags of FFP to get the same effect. Obviously, it will depend on the oral anticoagulant and it will depend on the patient. But in general, we should be using Beriplex and not FFP. Ensure that if we get a control call about a query transfusion reaction, that we bring any units issued to the patient back and that we communicate with other staff members what is going on. In hospitals there are so many people that get involved in patients treatments that it's very easy for one person to be aware of something and the next person not to be. We've had it before in the lab where the doctors are aware of this patient, a patient having TACO, the lab hasn't taken back the units and then 
also hasn't told the MLAs what's going on. Someone has come from the ward who's a nurse and has just seen that an extra unit of blood is prescribed in the notes. So they've come to collect it. And it's only because someone in the lab has overheard what's going on that they've managed to prevent this. So it's really important that if you have a query transfusion reaction, that we bring the units into the stock fridge and hold them there until we are satisfied with what is going on with the patient. And finally, clinicians need to ensure that they assess patients before transfusion so that if they do have any risk factors, these are taken into account and the patient is closely monitored. As I said before, you can have tackle just one unit, but normally it's because the patient has underlying health conditions. Right, so we're going to move on to a case study. Um, just a quick one. We had a patient present with a haemoglobin of 72. They had a history of shortness of breath and acute kidney injury. Their blood pressure was 120 over 50, which is a normal range, and their oxygen sats were 97, which again was within normal range. They had a temperature of 37.1. They had no renal impairment and presented with bilateral swollen ankles and lung crackles. Pre-transfusion, they had shortness of breath and were on two litres of oxygen. So before we get on to them having the transfusion, you can already see, firstly, the haemoglobin is above the normal recommended guideline. It should be less than 70. So really the BMS should have questioned that. Uh, and it might have been that it was agreed that it was okay for this to happen because at the end of the day, the BMSs can only ask so much and then it's down to the clinicians to decide. Um, the fact that they have the history of shortness of breath is a bit of a worry and they already have lung crackles. So that's one of the symptoms already before starting the transfusion. So they requested one unit of blood despite the haemoglobin being 72, which is above the threshold as I previously mentioned, and the BMS on duty issued the unit. As I said, I don't know what the discussion was surrounding this, um, but I'm sure there was one. They began the transfusion at 9.33 in the morning. And the clinicians then phoned the laboratory at 11.30, stating that the patient had query trolley. They stopped the transfusion at 12.04 due to the dyspnea. The patient presented with wheezing, increased IMP and neck veins. Their heart rate was 82. Oxygen stats were now 94, which is below the normal limit, only just. And the blood pressure was 128 over 90, which again was slightly raised. Based on that, do you think that this is Charlie, as they're suggesting, or could it be Taco, or could it just be down to the patient's own conditions? If we have another look at it, you can see that the oxygen sats were low, which is expected in both Charlie and Taco. Blood pressure was slightly raised. And if we go back to the um, table, you can see that the blood pressure is normally raised in Taco, not Charlie. They were treated with a diuretic and a chest x-ray was ordered. By 4.21, the patient's shortness of breath had improved and their oxygen was still at 94. They contacted the haematology consultant who advised that the symptoms were due to heart failure rather than a transfusion reaction. The transfusion practitioner still investigated because we've been alerted of a um, transfusion reaction. And she concluded that the reaction occurred within six hours of transfusion and the O2 sats were reduced. BP showed slight increase um, and the patient had chest crackles and oedema both to both ankles pre-transfusion. Intervention with diuretics improved the condition and these findings support a diagnosis of circulatory overload, possibly exasperated by transfusion. So, as we mentioned before, um, diuretics are used to treat Taco, not Charlie. So despite the clinicians querying Charlie, they did treat with the correct thing. And it's important here to take home that the clinicians did think it was the wrong thing. But obviously someone's come along and realised what's going on. The patient had an underlying health condition which has either caused this or contributed to it, depending on how you look at it. So what we need to take away from this is the following. 
The chances of it being trialy when the patient was transfused blood, not platelets or FFP, are so, so low and so unlikely, regardless of how the patient presented. As mentioned, the patient had the pre-existing condition, but the transfusion seems to have made it worse. It's easy to get the two conditions confused, and this is the biggest point that I want people to take home from this presentation, is when in the hospital, the patient's present in a very similar manner and it is their results that give away what is going on. So it's really important that clinicians and the lab are aware of the two and can ask questions about what's going on with the patient to indicate what should be done next. If we had said, oh yeah, it's definitely Charlie or just agreed with them and put out another unit of blood, then we could have made it worse. Um, luckily, we didn't do that. I don't think they had any further units of blood. It's so important for us as the laboratory to be aware of these things as well. I'd just like to thank everyone so much for watching. If you can complete a reflection on this presentation, and again, feel free to contact me with any questions that you have, that would be great. Um, hopefully this has been of some interest to you. But I look forward to the next CPD talk. Thanks so much. Bye.